All right, title of the sermon this morning is A Godly Wife and Mother. A Godly Wife and Mother. So today is obviously Mother's Day, so I'm just uh, thinking about that. Um, so I just thought I'd take this opportunity to you know, encourage um, the women of our church and the mothers in our church this morning um, by talking about the value of being a wife and a mother and the high calling of God in Christ Jesus that that is. So, you know, Mother's Day is sometimes a sensitive time for some people. You know, some people don't or can't have children. Uh, maybe somebody's lost a child. Maybe somebody's lost, uh, lost their mother. So I think compassion is necessary, but, you know, you shouldn't stop others from celebrating or honouring their mothers on this day, um, should they choose to. You know, we live in a very snowflake generation where everyone's getting offended. Um, you know, so we need to have that balance where, yeah, we have compassion for people that may not um, you know, that Mother's Day may bring up uh, negative emotions for them, but we shouldn't stop people from wanting to celebrate their mothers and honour their mothers on a day like today. And, you know, maybe if you do celebrate Mother's Day and make a big fuss of it, you better, you know, do it before they turn it into, you know, birthing person's day or something, um, the way the world is going. So let's get into the sermon. I've got three things I want to talk about this morning. First section is wife and mother. Wife and mother. So we'll start here at where we read in the chapter 1 Timothy 5, verse 11. But the younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation, because they have cast off their first faith. And with all they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also and busybodies speaking things which they ought not. So it's funny that it's saying here, yeah, you know, women, if they, you know, are not busy raising a family and, and keeping themselves busy with these things, they tend to be going around gossiping, busybodies. I guess there's nothing new under the sun, right? Even back then, women tended to that, and even today, they do that as well. Verse 14, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. So it's a good thing for women to be married, bear children, guide the house. And uh, you know, one thing I noticed about this verse when I was thinking about it this time around is every aspect of that verse is being attacked today. That's how opposite the world is from Bible-believing Christianity. I remember I was looking over my old notes when I preached a sermon like this, and I said, oh, the world is against two aspects, just you know, women getting married and women bearing children. But then when I think about it now, every single aspect of this verse is under attack by the world's agenda. And think about this, it's saying the younger women marry. So, you know, people now put off marriage. They don't get married when they're young. They say, well, before I get married, I want to you know, go to go to university and get a job and then travel the world and do all these things. And then they end up getting married in their 30s and, and mid-30s and 40s. Whereas the Bible says he wants the younger women to marry. I mean, even this one, it says the women marry. You know, nowadays it's like you got, you know, same-sex marriage, you got like, you know, women, uh, you know, men pretending to be women, and then them, you know, you got breastfeeding men, and men that have periods, it's just like, it's all this crazy stuff that's going on in the world. So you can't even take for granted now that it's women that get married, because, you know, uh, are the women that are marrying, are bearing children, guiding the house, because now you got all these women pretending to be men and saying men do all these, do these things. Bearing children. You know, women nowadays, they, what do they do? They want, they, they're encouraged to choose careers over their children. You know, you've got uh, superstars getting up at these, uh, what was that lady that got up at the uh, uh, Golden Global Award saying, uh, you know, she, she couldn't have got this award unless she had an abortion. She murdered her child. And, uh, you know, this is the, the way the world's going. That women are choosing these things and children are now a hindrance to that rather than the goal that they should have, according to the Bible. Guide the house. That's also under attack now. Now you have both parents working. You know, where the, the parents put their child in daycare so that both parents can work to, to maintain a living standard, you know, and, and uh, there's all the, those problems too. Or maybe switching roles. You know, now you've got house husbands instead of housewives. 
So you can see that the world is going the complete opposite of this verse. This verse says, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Now I've heard an objection to this verse that says, hey, well, this is only an instruction to younger widows. Yeah, well, is it just because you've been married and you've lost your husband before that God has a different will for you? See, that doesn't, that doesn't make sense. And, it, and when you compare it to Titus 2, you can see the consistency in the Bible that it's not just talking about widows. It's referring to the fact that they are younger women and this is what they should be striving to do. Titus 2, 3, look, the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. Look, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands. Do you see how they're married? To love their children. See that they have children? To be discreet, chaste. This is tall. See, this, even this is under attack today, that women, you know, they're meant to, be, to have discretion. Chaste is purity. But you look at the women today, they dress all in tight clothes or no clothes, and just social media is, is just filled with immodest, unchaste women. Keepers at home. See, so there's the, you know, marry, bear children, guide the house. Good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. So let me ask you something here. Let me ask you as a Christian. Do you believe God's word? Or do you believe this is wrong? Because, you know, I, I get the feeling, you know, when I preach on passages like 1 Timothy 5 and Titus 2, 3, and on Mother's Day, you know, maybe you get the feeling, you know, you look at the verse, you're like, is Victor going to touch on that verse today? Yeah, I'm going to touch on that verse today. And the reason why I'm touching on the verse is because, look, the world already hates this. We don't need Christians hating this too. So my question is, do you believe this? See, when you read a verse like this, do you say, as a believer in God's word, do you think, ah, oh, this is just oppressive patriarchy? Or do you think, no, no, there's a reason why God wills this for younger women? Because it's not about oppression. It's about seeking the higher calling of God in Christ Jesus because doing this is what's valuable. See, the world wants you to think this is not valuable. The world wants you to think that, you know, just being a mother, just raising children, oh, you didn't make anything of your life, right? So they think what's making something of your life is doing something vain, right? And building up you know, all, all the prestige of the world and all the materialism of the world and all the recognition of the world. What, are you, what do you seek? You know, do we seek the recognition of God and what's valuable to God, or do we seek what's valuable to the world? So this is why I harp on about this, because we need to change how we think about this, that when we look at verses like this, it's like, oh, you know, this, is the, this is the oppressive side, this is the part of Christianity I don't like. No, we should look at verses like this and say, yes, why does God have it this way? This is valuable, you know? So maybe the world doesn't value getting married being a mom, raising children, but not in this church. In this church, we value that, you know, and we want to encourage women to do that because that's what God wants them to do. We encourage people to do the will of God. So the question is, do you believe this? Do you believe God's word? Or do you believe this is wrong? You know, so we need to change, we need to start first in the house of God. If we have any, if we have any hope of changing the values of the world out there and the people out there, got to start here. We've got to believe it first. This is one of our memory verses. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, he shall direct thy paths. Gosh, what a beautiful verse. You know, people put it on the wall. People put it on bookmarks. You know, it's encouraging. What does it mean? You know, <laughs> It doesn't mean that you read God's word and you just think, ah, oh, you know, I don't like that one. This is saying you trust in the Lord. You trust what God is saying with all your heart. You don't lean onto your own understanding. So you may have gotten an understanding from the world. But you think what's better. No, we trust in the Lord with all our heart. We don't lean onto our own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. So part of that is God's will for a woman 
be married, bear children, guide the house. Not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Right? And if you acknowledge that and you trust in that, you don't lean into your own understanding, it's going to direct you in the right way. What's the right way? To be a mother, to be a wife, to raise your children godly, to make that your purpose in life and not chasing some career unnecessarily. You know? Philippians 3.13. This is the verse I touched on. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So do you believe this is a high calling? You know, is being a mother to the Christian lady just something you want to do in life? You know, some people think of that. They, yeah, as kids is something I want to do in my life one day. You know, but it's not there. But, but it, or, or is being a wife and a mother, is that what you want to be? You know, is, is, is that something to you of value? Or is it just something, a passing phase? You know, yeah, I've done the marriage thing. I've done the wife thing. Uh, I've done the mum thing. Now I'm going to get somebody else to raise my kids and then I'm going to go live my own life, you know, both parents working, not really being a wife at home and a support to my husband. You know, what is it? So what sort of wife are you? What sort of mother are you? See, and I don't ask these questions. You know, I don't, see, this is what I mean. See, I don't ask these questions just to make you feel bad. You know, it's to get you to reflect on these things. You know, this is why it's, it's good to be challenged in church. It's not about, oh, Victor's just being hard on us, Victor wants to make us feel bad every week. I'm trying to get you to reflect on this because if you reflect on it, then maybe it'll change you. You know, so when you go about being a wife and a mother, you know, do you do it with purpose, with the mind that you are not just existing, you are doing the will of God. You know, because it's, and it's tough, you know, because, you know, being, being, being a mom is tough. And any, everyone in any area of life gets into a rut. You start thinking, I'm just, I'm just surviving, I'm just existing. No, you are, you are doing what God has called you to do. Um, you know, being a mother, being a wife. You know, there's a common thing that people say, oh, they're ju just a housewife, which I, I always joke is like, uh, well, not really joking, I say it joking, you know what I'm saying, like humorously. But they say, just a housewife. And it's, it's a bit of an oxymoron. Because the world says, oh, well, yeah, it's just a housewife. But then on days like Mother's Day, they talk about how hard it is to be a mother. You know? And, you know, that's so difficult. And, you know, even when we talk about how many kids we have, we're like, oh, I can't believe you got seven kids. So, so the world, on one hand, doesn't value being a wife and a mother. And on the other hand, on days like today, being a mother is, like, so valuable and it's the hardest job in the world. You know, I wouldn't say it's the hardest job in the world. It's definitely a difficult job. There's definitely harder jobs than taking care of children. But it is a hard job. And that's why a lot of people don't have lots of children, because it's difficult. And you know, when they do have children, they don't even want to raise them themselves. They want to put them in a school. They want to put them in daycare. They want other people to raise them, because it's not easy, right? But it is a valuable thing to do. And then you add to that, Today's philosophy of positive parenting. Well, we're not negative to our kids. We don't spank our kids. We don't tell them that they're wrong. And it just makes it even more difficult. You know, that's why it's always, I always find it funny when, you know, I talk to people, maybe you guys with multiple kids are the same. Maybe when you get to the numbers we have, you might get this reaction more often from people. But, you know, they ask you, how many kids do you have? I say, I've got seven, seven children. Now, their jaw drops not just because they think I'm 18 years old, <laughs> but their jaw also drops because they, what they wonder, how do you, that, that home must just be chaotic. Now, I'm not saying that the home is not filled with life, but you know, the reason why they think that is because they think maybe the children in their life, which are absolutely out of control, that there are seven of those. So, so, yeah, if you can have children, but raising them is, is not so easy, right? And this is why. It's, they say it's just a housewife. Is it just because it's, just un, because it's unpaid? I mean, is that how we determine value in our life? Whether somebody's willing to pay you for it? Or are there valuable things in life that aren't necessarily paid positions? So, 
we don't want this philosophy in our church. We don't want this philosophy in Christianity where we devalue the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, which is younger women marrying, bear children, guiding the house, giving none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachful. So don't get this attitude, bad attitude of my children don't let me accomplish anything because raising your children is the accomplishment. You see? So anything on top of that is, is cream on top, right? Because you are doing a great work. You know, it reminds me of, uh, you know, when Nehemiah is like building the walls. Like, don't bring me down. I'm doing a great work for God. And that's why I sometimes think about women that go and get distracted with other things. Don't, don't, don't get pulled off the wall because you're doing a great thing for God. Okay? It's a high calling. So I think it's good to be reminded today. You know, children, number two, children are valuable. Children are valuable. And they're much more valuable than anything that this world can offer. Don't, don't get caught up in this world's philosophy of like, well, now we've got to get these children out of the way. I don't have too many children going to stop me from achieving my, my dreams. But you need to think as well, like what, what are these dreams? Are they, are they more valuable than raising children? Like God's will for younger women. Mark 8, 36. It says here, what, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So this verse is saying that your life, your soul is more valuable than anything in the world. We use this verse to talk in soul wind. And people put off getting saved. And it's like, what are you going to exchange for your soul? What is worth going to hell for? At the very least, you, you get saved because, you know, what's the point of life? What's the point of anything you gain in this world? Like, you know, you become like, uh, the, you know, the next Steve Jobs. Or, the, or no, no, now it's Elon Musk, right? I keep using Steve Jobs, living in the past. So it's not Steve Jobs anymore. Now it's like you're the next Elon Musk, right? But what shall it profit a man? He shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. See, so your life is valuable. So how valuable is the life of your children when you have a child? Something enters into your life, in, into your possession, that is more valuable than anything the world can offer. Do you realize that? So an illustration, you know, like if it's like if I said to you, if I was giving away, let's say if I was giving away gold coins, and I just had a stash of gold coins, I'm just giving them away. And I asked you, how many would you like? What's your answer? Your answer would probably be, well, how many do you have? Yeah, how many can you give me? So why do we not have that same mentality with children? If children are the most valuable thing that we can possess as parents. Do we not have that same attitude of, well, how many children should we have? Well, how many is possible to have? You know, with, you know obviously, you've got to take into account your health and all these things, but you know, are you striving to have as many as possible? Do you, do you see them as valuable? If you see them as valuable, then you will want to have more. So children are valuable, but sometimes you need to be reminded because it's so easy to forget, you know, when you see them every day. You know, when we see something every day, we start taking them for granted, but no, we have to be reminded. Children are valuable. And having children requires work and sacrifice. So you may not get to enjoy all the pleasures that this life can offer, but let me tell you something, it's worth it. It's worth it. And I think we need to be reminded of that as we look in God's Word. So let's look at a couple of verses uh, on, on children in the Bible. Genesis 1.26, right at the very beginning, one of the first commandments God gives to man. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So that's a, I always like to point that out, that you know, man is created in the image of God, not female. Because being created in the image of God is not talking about your worth as a human being. Being created in the image of God means that you look like God, right? So God is a male. God looks like a man. He created man in his own image. That's why it says, in the image of God created he him. But then the female was created to help the man from the rib of the man. 
So female is created as a support. They both have value, value. They're both body, soul, and spirit. But I don't believe this is what being created in the image of God is referring to. This is being refer this is referring to man actually looking like a man, looking like God. And God blessed them and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So you see here, this is one of the first commands of God. That God values children too. That when he created man and woman, one of the first commands he gave them, you know, besides to not eat the tree, right? He said to be fruitful and multiply. You know, replenish the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Psalm 127.3, this is a verse that Helena and I were talking about recently. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb in his, is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. So there's a couple of things there. See how children are a reward, children are a heritage. You see, so they're something valuable. They're also something that's very effective in the world, right? Like arrows are in the hand of a mighty man. So are children of the youth. So you can see that we have children young, children of the youth. They're like arrows, right? When we send them into the world and we've sharpened them right and are using them right, they will cause a lot of damage to Satan's agenda. But why? They have to be in the hand of a mighty man. So are you a mighty man? So if you're not a mighty man, your arrows may not be as effective as they could be. Five, happy is the man that has his quiver full of them. Do you see how they're valuable? You ought to want a lot of children because the Bible says, hey, happy is the man that has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Deuteronomy 28, when we talk about the blessings of God in the Old Testament, look at what it says here, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shalt thou be in the city, blessed shalt thou be in the field. Look at this. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy ground and the fruit of thy cattle, the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep. See, when you think of blessed, if you are a farmer, let's say you're trying to grow some crop, and you say like, oh man, my crop is just being blessed by God, and you just have like two tomatoes, you know, one tomato, two tomatoes, oh, I want a blessing, two. No, your blessing is... When it's, it's abundant, right? So it's the same here. It's just, blessed shall be the fruit of thy body. It's a good thing that we have many children. First Timothy 5. Let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years old, having been the wife of one man. So this is a couple of verses before the ones we're focusing on, 11 onwards. So this is talking about whether to take in a widow as a, you know, sort of a full-time employee into the church. There's a certain requirements, kind of like being a deacon, being a bishop. Well reported of for, look at this, good works. Now what are part of these good works? If she have brought up children, if she have loved strangers, if she had washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. So you can see that, that raising children is one of the Good works, right, of Christianity is raising children. So those are some of the verses. We can get a picture of how God views children. You know, and this is one of the purposes of this sermon. I want to encourage the moms, you know, and exhort you guys. But I want you to start renewing your mind to see marriage and family and the roles in marriage, not like the world sees it, but the way God sees it. Now, having children has it also a real impact in the world. Um, what do I mean by that? Is that when Christians multiply, right, this also results in influence within the society you live in. This is what the Muslims are doing. Right? The Muslims multiply like crazy, and they are changing the landscape of local areas, right? Because there is a real impact to having children. And this is why 
part of being salt and light in the world is you've got to be around long enough to impact society. But if Christians are not having children and they're not replacing themselves, Satan doesn't need to kill us. We're killing ourselves off. Exodus 1.8, look at this. Now there arose, this is, this is in uh, uh, Exodus, and Israel now has come out, they've moved into Egypt, and um, they're living there. You remember in Genesis, you know, Joseph, uh, Jacob, Israel goes over, and then they live in the land of Goshen, because Joseph gives them that land there. And this is Exodus 1, when they start to be oppressed. Now it's interesting, now why were they being oppressed? Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. You see that? So what was Egypt worried about? Why did they oppress the Israelites? They were worried because they were becoming a greater and mightier people than the Egyptians. How? Because they were being fruitful and multiplying. So you see how there's a real impact in the world just by having children and children having children that you will exponentially outgrow those in your local area, right? Yeah. And, he, and, and verse 10, come on, let us deal wisely with them. You see, now they're a threat. They're a threat just by multiplying, lest they multiply and it comes to pass that when they fall without any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us. And so get them up out of the land. You see? See how people is power. Therefore, they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Python, Ramses. The more they afflicted them, the more they grew and multiplied, multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. So you see how tribulation and persecution wasn't enough to stop them from having children. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. They made their lives bitter with hard bondage and mortar and brick and all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. Right? So this is oppressive slavery, slavery here. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was Shifra and the name of the other Pua. And he said... When you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. The king of Egypt called for the midwives and said unto them, Why have you done this thing and have saved the men children alive? And the midwives said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, but they are lively and are delivered ere the midwives come in unto them. So obviously they're, they're deceiving the Pharaoh here, right? So deception is not always a bad thing. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. So you can see here what was the tactic of Pharaoh. First, it's to oppress them. That doesn't stop them from multiplying. Then it's to actually try and kill them off, right? By killing their, 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 their males, right? Well, the, that doesn't stop either because they, the midwives just... You know, well, well, we can't because they, they just get, give birth without us. But it seems like what has been effective today is the spiritual battle of convincing Christians that it's not valuable to raise a lot of children. One child's enough. Two, child's, two children are enough for me. Do you know, in order to just maintain a society's population, you need more than... What, what, what is it called? It's called the um, replacement fertility rate. Right? You need, when you look at the replacement fertility rate, it's, it's on average how many children are people having. Now, to, to keep a society just alive, it's not two children. Right? So Australia and many countries now, the, 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 um, what is it called? the replacement fertility rate is less than two. Right? But then in, you know, probably Islamic countries and all that sort of stuff, it's way higher, three, four. And, this, and you wonder why the world is changing, right? The world is shifting towards, you know, these sort of ideals. It's because they're being replaced. Now, the replacement fertility rate has to be more than two. Why? Because not everyone has children. Some people, you know, through death and other accidents, you know. So the replacement rate has to be like 2.1 just to just survive. 
So think about that in a more like sort of microeconomic way. For us, if we are to survive as a society within Liverpool, then we need to have a replacement fertility rate of more than 2.1. Otherwise, you know, as I was saying, Satan doesn't have to go and try kill us and persecute us because eventually we're just all going to be gone and we're not replacing ourselves. You see? So there is a real impact in the world if you don't have children. And that's just another factor to take into account that children are valuable and why you want to have them. You want to impact the world when you're gone. You don't leave that generation behind and teach them, then it will all come to naught. So this is my last section. Number three, like I said, the impact we can have in the world for Jesus Christ, it will come to naught if we do not raise our children to hold our beliefs. Right? So this is why we, we need to make sure that they understand what they believe, why they believe it. And this is why you need to make sure. Matthew 5.13. This is why we're like salt. You know, the Bible says we're salt. You know when you salt something, it sprinkles, you know, you put like a little bit of salt on your food and it's sprinkled all over. But every bite, you taste it. Right? So you can see how the impact of each of those grains of salt affects a wide area on that piece of food. So it's the same. We are like salt of the earth. You know, we're scattered all over. And the more children you have, the more scattered you can be, right? The more flavor you're going to give to the world. Yes, the salt of the earth, but if the salt had lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out, to be trotted under foot of men. You see, so the salt doesn't just have to be scattered. The salt has to have flavor, right? It has to have truth. So we don't teach our children. If we don't know what we're talking about, we will not be as effective in this world as we could be. This is why it's so important for us to teach our children, to spend time with our children so that they know what we believe, so that they believe it, and they know why it's the truth. Deuteronomy 6.4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. So you see, this verse is not only talking about making sure we teach our children. What picture does this give you in verse 7, when it says, Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, it gives you the idea that your children are with you for most of the time. They're with you because when they're with you, then you talk to them. You experience life with them, and then you can impart to them, hopefully, the wisdom that you have. And that's why it says in verse 6, These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. So it needs to start by being in you, and then you spend time and effort with your children imparting that knowledge to them. Let's go on. Ephesians 6.17 And take the helmet of salvation with the sword and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So we know that our spiritual weapon in this fight is the Word of God. So we need to be equipped with the Word of God by hiding God's Word in our heart, having that knowledge. So let me ask you, you know, the Word of God is perfect. The Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. The Word of God is our, our only offensive thing in this, this armor of God. You know, we have the armor of God and our one offensive thing is the Word of God. But let me ask you, what use is a perfect Word of God when it's unknown? You know, what use is a perfect sword and a weapon when you don't have it on you? You know, this is like the argument with people, you know, with guns. So what's the point of having the right to have a gun when you can't even carry it, when you can't even have it with you when you need it? You know, you have to have it locked up somewhere away. Well, it's not going to help you when you actually need to defend yourself. And it's the same here, when you have to take part in the spiritual fight. 
It's not gonna, what's, what's, what does it matter if it's perfect if you don't know it and you don't know how to use it? Ephesians 6, 4, another thing to consider. And when it comes to teaching children, and ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So raising children requires both parents. You know, both parents have to be involved in raising the children. Right? And notice that it's fathers bringing them up in the nurture and admonition. So yes, whilst women may be more nurturing and men may be more disciplinary, it shouldn't be that. Nurture and discipline should be coming from both parents. Right? So both parents. It's not mum is nurture and father is admonition. Right? It is fathers bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So we need to try to be setting the example to our wives on how to love and also you know, admonish our children. So how do we do that? We should be an example. So even to the mothers, you know, how do we effectively raise our children? We need to be an example to them. It has to start with us. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. So this is talking about leaders in a church, how they should lead. And we can take the same principle. We don't just lead here, verse 3, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. So this philosophy even carries over even to the world's methods of leadership. Right, where we say leaders shouldn't just be sitting and just telling people what to do. They should be leading by example. That's exactly what this is saying here. Don't just be lords over God's heritage, but be examples to the flock. Don't just tell your children what to do, but you don't do it yourself. You know, how many times do we see that in churches these days? Oh, parents expect their children to be involved in evangelism and outreach. Parents expect their children to go along to youth group and connect with other children. But no, they just go along on Sunday. They don't connect with people. They're not leading by example. You know, do you expect your children to memorize the verses in Kids Club? Maybe you should too. You know, are you guilty of the same thing where you expect your children to do something that you won't do? This is why you've got to lead by example. And I think if you do, your children will be more excited about it too. You know, memorizing the verses. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, so this is our perfect example, right? Jesus Christ. We, ye shall receive the crown of glory that fadeth not away. So you're going to be rewarded for the example that you set. And the last thing we'll talk about, and this, this is just, we're just, I'm just raising different factors of making sure we raise our children right, you know, especially to the mothers today. Making sure we raise our children right. You've got you to spank them when they need it. You know, make sure we spank our children when it's required. And usually it's required more often than, than we do it, <laughs> right? And it's easy. It's easy to not do. You know, even I'm guilty of the same thing, where they, they need a smack, but you're just too lazy to do it, right? You feel like you're doing it all the time. Well, this is part of raising children. You've got to teach them, you've got to tell them off sometimes, and you've got to give them a smack when they need it. Hebrews 12.6 for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? So that's a good thing to reflect on. You know, fathers, if you're not involved in the chastening of your children, in the discipline of your children, it's saying, I mean, what sort of father are you? This is why the Bible is saying here, I mean, what sort of God, what sort of father is God if he doesn't chastise his children, keep them in line and make sure they are obe obedient? For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live? But they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. And saying that there is a temporary time where chastening children is appropriate, right? So it's not like you chasten adults. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, 
Now, ain't that the truth? No chastening for the saying, when it happens, it ain't fun. And it's not fun. And this is why the world doesn't like it. But it's but grievous. So don't expect disciplining your children and spanking them is something that is pleasant. It's not pleasant. But nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So, in conclusion, and mainly to the women in the church today, but it's profitable for men to know, strive to be a godly wife and mother. Believe God's word. Don't buy into the world's philosophies on what is truly valuable. Children are valuable. Have many. Don't forget this. Teach your children. Spend time with them. Make sure they know what they believe and why it's true. And last thing I want you to know is make sure you're leading by example. You know, don't get your children to do things that you don't expect, you don't expect of yourself. Let's lead by example, not as lords over God's heritage. Remember, children are a heritage of the Lord, but in samples to the flock. And yes, that, that doesn't just apply in church, that applies to your family as well. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word, and thank you for the, um, you know, that your word is, exhorts us, encourages us. Um, Lord, help today your word to renew our mind. Let's not buy into the world's thoughts on how you have things. Let's understand what you have. Let's value it. And at the very least, let it start in the house of God. So I thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the wisdom that you give to us and, and impart to us through your word. Uh, give us the grace, Lord, to believe it and obey it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.